On Thursday, the National Assembly acceded to President Bola Tinubu's request to extend the 2023 main and supplementary budget from June 30th to December 31st. As a result, the federal government will not be running four, four, one, two, three, four. Uh, budget concurrently this year. The two extended 2023 budget, the 2024 budget, and an expected 2024 supplementary budget. But it has rightly described this situation as an anomaly with no precedence. Well, I have international finance and economic analyst uh, Mukhtar Mohammed. He joins me every week to discuss more on economic matters. Good morning to you, Mukhtar. Thank you, Justin. Good morning. All right, so just where do we start? Let's talk about, let's start with the budget. Mokta, I, um, I don't know if it's, um, uh, like I said, like I just read, now, it's, there's no precedent where we've um, actually run four budgets concurrently. I hope we're not biting off so much that we can chew. What, what's your opinion, really? Let's start from there. You know, we always say something, uh, um, Nigeria, Nigeria always come up with their own strategy in terms of unorthodox to me because uh, I would say it's an orthodox way. Where in the world do you have four budget running concurrently? I mean, and the challenge I have is that um, the, the 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 normal budget, I mean, the one that is even a single budget, would not be able to even achieve forty percent mm. in terms of uh, execution. Now you have four budget running concurrency. How do you how do you monitor it? How does the national assembly get to monitor it? What are the the the, the, the key objective of each of these budget? Budget 2023, budget 2024, budget I mean, what are the objectives? Supplementary budget 2023, supplementary budget 2024. So, what are the objectives of this budget? What is the aim? Where are they really? Uh, what are they really trying to achieve with this budget? For me, um, that should be our takeaway. But it just looks like a, a budget that is run, um, a budget that will be run with lack of transparency and. I think for me that's a big issue. Okay, see, I, you are the international finance analyst here. I'm still trying to wrap my head around why we always need a supplementary budget. Okay, fine, we've not, uh, we, we're not able to conclude with that of 2023. We started the 2024 budget, and of course there's a 2024 supplementary budget you know, in the pipeline. So my question right now would be, you know, what impact does it really have directly on key sectors of the economy? Justin, it has impact because remember before now, um, during President Lucia Gobasanjo, he came up with a policy that said um, um, once a budget fund is not executed, it must be returned back to the national treasury. Mm. Yeah. That is one. So, um, so what you see then is that um, towards the end of the year, a lot of ministries or parastators try to make sure that they, 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 they use up all the money for their budget, and that gives room for corruption. And then came uh, the, the, the other National Assembly decided that to say, you know what, uh, instead of just rushing up and this is giving room for corruption and lack of transparency, they came up with the doctrine of necessity that a budget can run for the next six months, even after, um, after it's a, a, a period of, of, of a laughter. So they now have a six months uh, 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 time given to the budget so that you could finish that budget um, uh, cycle. But President um, um, Buhari came and said that they want to return to the January, February, January, December cycle. And they came up and more pulled everything. So you could see that uh, that's why the challenge we are having now is that we were not really prepared to have the January to December because of the peculiarity of our of our, of, our, of, our, of, our, of our government or of our country. Now, it has, I, I said it before Bola Tinubu came to power. I said there is no time in the history of this country when a new administration comes to power and decides to run with the previous administration budget. It's always been that they will send a supplementary budget because they seem to have an idea of what they want to achieve in the next six months does not correspond with the idea of what the previous administration with, even when they are the same political party. Mm. So we, the, we begin to see that there's no ideology to say, okay, this is what is expected when APC is in government, this is what is expected when PDP is in government. I think that, for me, is the major, 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 major challenge. I, the, the key takeaway here is that it will be difficult to really achieve any meaningful mm. uh, results from this budget because it is scattered. And so what we are achieving, are we achieving 
well, based on 2023 or are we achieving on the 2024? So I think what the government should have done at that time was to see how they can extend the lifeline of the 2023 budget and then prepare a very good budget. But again, when they came to power, they did a supplementary budget. So mm -hmm. they should allow the supplementary budget and the 2023 budget to run and elapse. Mm -hmm. And then you cannot begin to present the 2024. But like I said, this government seems not to be so prepared for governance. Mm -hmm. And so they seem to do all about trial and error. It's unprecedented in the history of the war that four budgets will be running concurrently. Mm -hmm. For me, it's, it gives room for chaos, it gives room for lack of transparency, and majorly it gives room for a lot of corrupt tendencies. Okay, you've said a whole lot concerning, uh, you know, the governance structure in the country and how previous some um, governments have um, done in terms of um, planning budget now. But what are the key lessons, really, especially for our budget um, office and the budget manager? Because you see, it seems to me that uh, we still have a whole lot to do, maybe overhaul in the budget processes in the country so that um, over time we'll not be having all of these challenges. What should be the lessons for the budget office? I think the lesson with the budget office is um, um, to be uh, very proactive, um, especially in the year that you know I'm a solution will change hand. You should know that it's a supplementary budget that is going to come. So you, you must be very proactive. And uh, in being proactive, then you need to stand up to the institution and let them know what is workable and what is not workable. Because what we have seen is that it seems to think everything is workable and they just go in even if they are key professional in the budget office. So, so I think the key, the, the, the key uh, lessons I think they should learn, they should be proactive mm. in terms of when it comes to budgets. All right, let's slide over now and talk about financial stability. The central bank is in the news. Just yesterday, it talked about uh, risk concerns uh, uh, about growing transaction volumes of um, NBFIs, uh, that is, uh, non-bank financial institutions, and of course, other financial institutions. And uh, it is citing that um, its significance is that impacting on the financial stability in West Africa. In my head, I thought that uh, it is uh, a good development uh, with the, what the fintechs are doing in the country and uh, financial, uh, deepening financial, uh, you know, yes, to every aspect of Nigeria. And most Nigerians now have access to some sort of a financial transaction, which is uh, what we didn't really have before. But right now, the central bank seems to say that uh, they are even doing more than they should have done, even without them um, appropriate licensing. What are your thoughts? Uh, well, you know, the FinTech uh, space is a space that has come to stay. And uh, some of them are not even, like he said, some of them are not even uh, monitored. Mm -hmm. um, that is the, that's a very big, 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 big challenge in the film tech space. So that for me is, is, is the biggest challenge, but I think the film tech space have come to stay. Um, those film techs that are being monitored are those that are under, maybe as holding company under the banks, because they are allowed to operate, that's the, the, that's the way it is. But again, um, it's something that, um, the CBN and others should really come together and begin to come up with modality on how they can be regulated because funding is involved, even if it's non-financial, but it's still somehow financial because it's an exchange of uh, fund from one from one uh, uh, account, I mean one person to another, rather digitally. Uh, I think um, with outside, when it comes to license, in terms of financial license, uh, you, you have to go to the Security and Exchange Commission and also have to go to the Central Bank of Nigeria. But unfortunately, what we have seen is that uh, some uh, uh, film tech company operate without this license and nothing seems to be done. I think uh, they need to begin to sit down and begin to look at uh, how they, 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 they can regulate um, this film tech company, especially like the CBN um, said about the loan app, mm. which we have called the loan shark. Mm. Um, these are people that are professionally, they are not, they, is their, 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 their way of doing business is not professional. They tend to uh, take advantage of people because the collateral you have to use is to use your, the number, the phone numbers of the people on your phone, and then you send them. And when these guys are not paying or the people that collect the loan, you start sending threatening messages to some of these uh, 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 um, Start sending a message to them, yes. and then also you begin to send message of uh, deformation of character to a lot of those people that you have their, 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 that you have on their you have their details because mm. you have used that details as a means of um, collateral, telling them oh these are thieves, these are criminals, these are wanted. 
So I think the, 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 the Central Bank of Nigeria climbed down on them to block all this loan shark up on any um, system in Nigeria. So that I think that's what they, they, they should keep doing to begin to see how they can regulate them and where they cannot be regulated. I think it's not okay science to shut them out of Nigerian space. That's why you have NCC and that's why you have the Security and Exchange Commission. And if you find out that there's a particular loan app, there's a particular company that's involving in transactional uh, financial transactional business that ought not to be, I think it's uh, necessary that you just shut them down. All right, but then again, you will agree with me that um, the fintech space is actually a welcome development. Uh, but there must be a way where both um, the you know the traditional banking um, institutions and um, this uh, this fintech other financial institutions can actually work peri pursue in terms of uh, maybe uh, getting to the unreached on your bank's population without necessarily you know. Uh, doing away with it because uh, recently the central bank came with some regulation to, to some of these um, uh, fintech space. I know Pump and so they stopped them from onboarding uh, new customers. And uh, just uh, not so long after, you know, they were asked again to start, uh, you know, onboarding new customers. So, how do we strike a bit of a balance so that way we can actually meet the unbanked and, of course, also ensure financial um, sanity in the system? You know, Justin, we've tried so many things when we tried to reach the own bank in Nigeria. We tried the People's Bank, remember? Oh. Then we came up with the Microfinance Bank. We came up with PO, POS terminals in uh, local, local places. And then the FinTech has come to digitalize all those processes. Oh. Now, in digitalizing those processes, again, it has created another problem, which is a regulatory uh, framework and problem. And so what the CBN was saying is that most of these fintech companies do not know, know your customer. There was no key, uh, know your customer database. So they oh, will, mm. for you, you need to know your customer because you're talking about financial transaction because a lot of transactions were going on that were illicit. Um, you talk about the money laundry. They were using mm. some of these fintech companies to perpetrate money laundry. So the CBN said no because those fintech companies were registered just at the comfort of your house with using your phone number and then you have an account. So they needed to be reg uh, 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 regulated, and that's why the CBN uh, told them, look, you need, you need to clean your house and come back to business. And I'm, I'm happy that some of them have really come back to business after going through what the CBN is. It's work in progress, they're still improving upon it. And sometimes you realize that some un underage people begin to use this platform also. It also became a platform whereby criminal activities were happening, just like the POS terminals these days, if you listen, a lot of criminal activities are passed through that space, whereby people take people card and they use the POS terminal uh, as an easy way to access those funds. So I think they need to be regulated. I, I totally agree with the CBN on this. Mm -hmm. And I think they should work hard to make sure that the fintech companies are fully regulated. I mean, what is, because you have, as long as you have uh, created, you have doing a financial product, product you are, you are, you are, product, you are, you are doing something that has to do with financial product. I still believe that uh, the Security and Exchange Commission, the CBN, should come together and make sure that any of these fintech companies that are not genuinely registered should be taken off the space of doing business in Nigeria. All right, let's slide away from uh, financial stability and inclusion and talk about um, our last uh, issue for today, which is uh, capital importation, FDI, and all of it. Uh, from reports from the NBS. Uh, uh, Nigeria's capital importation um, rose by 210% to $3.37 million uh, in the first quarter of this year. Break it down for us, Mokhtar. Well, when you see this, you are excited. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was, was anyway. <laughs> yeah. But when you go to the liquidity of it, then you begin to realize that mm. it's not something to be excited so much about. Uh -huh. uh, but what I'm excited about, when you look at those numbers, about 61 point something percent were portfolio investors. Mm. Where about 61 percent were portfolio investors, which I always say they come with the hot money. They came to our own market because they begin to realize the, the, the kind of yield they will get in our market. Uh, but that would translate to what we are supposed to see on our reserve bank because we are actually making that space attractive for them to come in so that we can get FX to boost our reserve. Mm. And, and uh, that has not really happened, but it's good to see that a lot of them are coming in. Uh, and then you look at the manufacturing, uh, the foreign 
the foreign direct investment space, you realize that this uh, was the least. It's, it's, mm. It was the least, and yes. that again is a big challenge because foreign direct investment are those that are coming in to stay for the long term. Mm -hmm. Portfolio investors are here for the short term, and so what True. it means is that whatever fund they have brought in at the time they want to exit, if you don't have so much of liquidity on the system, then you end up that will also end up affecting your your FX reserve and also affecting your foreign exchange market because they will have to sort for FX to leave. So, um, and when you look at those numbers, you realize that uh, the banking sector was the key driver of this foreign direct investor yes, it investment. Was. And when you look at those banks, for Stambik IBTC is majorly because of the yield in terms of fixed income. Mm -hmm. they, they seem to be specialized in those space. And so a lot of Nigerian diaspora like patronizing Stambik IBTC for that. Yes. If you look at Citibank, I think the fund that we are seeing from Citibank coming in is towards the recapitalization of the bank. Yes, because they want to recapitalize because bank, uh, the CBN have already said they should recapitalize. Mm -hmm. And that's why I keep saying that the CBN policy of recapitalization will drive FX into the Nigeria market in the long run. And we are seeing that already. Ram Merchant Bank, the same thing, you know, it's a South African based mortgage bank. So it's trying to beat up its activity, especially with the kind of uh, a mortgage activities that this administration will say that they, they, they may be engaging, I think. So what we are seeing from them also is that our capital imputation in terms of building up their their yeah. capital base so that they will still be in business. So, but when you look at that and look at others like manufacturing, it seems to be non-existent and that is where you really want to drive investment growth. All right, well said. Uh, but I'm still tempted to just chip one thing in before we just call it a morning. Just in, uh, just get a reaction in a minute, uh, so we can just wrap it up. Uh, let's still talk about minimum wage. Some people may not forgive me if I don't mention the minimum wage. You know, states. Uh, 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 there are concerns that it may push some state into bankruptcy. And um, you know, recently there were talks about um, states. Uh, you know, talking or handling their own uh, minimum wage by themselves. What are your opinion uh, concerning all of that? Well, I, 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 like I said one time in your program, I was, was saying again, the cost of living in Lagos mm. is different from the cost of living in Ikiti. The cost of living in Ikiti is different from the cost of living in Sokoto. Yeah. The cost of living in Taraba is different from the cost of living in River State. True. So the minimum wage ordinarily is the minimum you can pay any worker in Nigeria. Yes. But when you look at the peculiar condition, situation that we have find ourselves in, we must come up with a strategy on how to address it. First and foremost, I am not an advocate and in support of what the governor says, because they are saying all this now when we are almost at the end to start to implement the minimum wage, because they, mm. they should have said all this before now, yes. and when they, they never showed up in the negotiation, and all of a sudden they are beginning to put spinal of the work that everybody has been doing. Mm. So that's why I have a... a, a uh, um, um, uh, reservation uh, 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 and reservation mm. about them. Mm. So, but outside of that, I think um, the, the and the state governors have no reason to tell me they cannot pay because their revenue has also improved. All right. Um, I, I said it before. Their revenue have improved, and not just by ten percent, twenty. But we're talking of revenue of up to uh, fifty to sixty percent. And how mm. much are you going to increase the minimum wage? How much worker do you have? So yeah. the challenge with some of this government is that. Uh, most of the workers are political appointees and they seem to pay them so much. So for me, I, 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 I am not, um, I want the, the government to look at a living minimum wage for now. Yeah. And then in five years this time, they keep on updating this minimum wage because the minimum wage bill says that every five years, there should be a million yeah. ways to improve the minimum wage. And if we have been doing that, we may not have had the challenge of increasing it at this no, point, no, but won't have. I stand with the workers, they need a minimum wage. All right. And I think the least that they should, give, should be given is between 90000 and 100000 All right, thank you so much. I have been speaking with uh, International Finance and Economic um, Analyst Mokhtar Mohammed on these economic issues. Many thanks for being a part of the show, Mokhtar. Thank you for having me. All right, that's the size of the show for today. My name is Justin Akadonye. Many thanks for being around. See you again next time. Bye for now. Hello. Hope you enjoyed the news. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the notification button so you get notified about fresh news updates.